and the Democratic Party is silencing the very questions we should be asking because none of us know what is running the country. It is completely unforgivable that the American people would not be consulted as to what is happening in the executive branch. What I've been assured privately is that there is a team running the White House far better than Joe Biden and that I'm supposed to be elated because of the high competency of the team that has effectively replaced the president. Now, uh, these are levels of self-deception and self-justification that I just can't participate in. Mm. But what's fascinating is that this is what I've called uh, an anti-interesting event. The media is absolutely pathologically uninterested. Mm. In a world increasingly shaped by powerful elites and unseen forces, you might start to question who is really in control. Eric Weinstein dives deep into this in his latest video, exploring the complex dynamics of power, censorship, and societal control. He argues that we're not just dealing with political divisions, but a much larger struggle against an entrenched managerial class that controls key institutions and narratives. Weinstein warns that without transparency and open dialogue, we risk descending into a society ruled by shadowy figures, where conspiracy theories fill the vacuum left by a lack of honest information. This video urges viewers to wake up to the bigger picture. It's not just about politics as usual, but about reclaiming a world where truth can be spoken and the people in charge are held accountable. The, the, entire, uh, the entire political charade uh, has come crashing down. Nobody can believe anything that is being said. And so that's your cue that that's not what the game is anymore. It's not a question of getting people to believe. It's a, uh, these are instructions that you're being sent as to what you are supposed to act as if you believe, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're supposed to act as if you believe that uh, there was an inclusive process um, that took one of the least loved uh, politicians of all time, Kamala Harris, and elevated her to America's sweetheart, uh, you know, within the space of a few hours. Um, I just don't understand how rational people who are supposed to be our, our doctors, our accountants, our engineers who, who build bridges that don't collapse, how anybody who can solve a partial differential equation is supposed to go along with this, I have no clue. Because you have to understand that technical people, um, it's not personal, you know, there's just right and there's wrong. And everything about this is so completely wrong uh, from first principles that I would say that what we're doing is we're telling everyone with an IQ over 85, you're unwelcome uh, as part of the electorate because you're simply not going to be able to hold the illusion. He has not been uh, in my opinion, fit for office during the entire length of his presidency. And if you check my old tweets, you'll see that I'm talking constantly uh, about the fact that he's simply uh, not in good shape. Now, Donald Trump is, uh, I will also point out, 78 years old. Um, he is, in my opinion, far too old uh, for the most demanding job um, that we have in times of war. And quite frankly, um, we normalized all this with Dianne Feinstein. There is something mm. about these silent and boomer generation politicians that do not understand that they have to leave a world to their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And so they sit there as if they're going to go on forever. And I, I'm sort of surprised that they haven't introduced legislation uh, that says that we shouldn't discrimi discriminate the re against the recently deceased and that they should be able to hold office as well. This has just gotten to a point where um, it's an embarrassment and we have to realize that we need to pass the baton uh, to different generations. Mm -hmm. I think that what, what we're doing here is we're normalizing pathological behavior on behalf of two generations that will not take the hint that they have been bad for America. 2016, Donald Trump became the first um, politician never to have uh, served in political office mm -hmm. or in the military. So he was an absolute outsider. He made it through the primary screen. Then he made it through the general after being told he was a 20 to one uh, underdog and there was no plan. And so the, the, the fact is, is that they left open this tiny hole 
uh, for an, an actual Democratic event. And Donald Trump uh, contorted himself and squoze right through. Do you think he's going to win this election? Do I think Trump is going to win? Yeah. Like, yeah, likely. I yeah. think that if you look at um, the theory of Timur Quran and preference falsification, one of the reasons that you had this illusion of a, a Hillary uh, victory is a certainty is that people have to lie about their um, support for Trump against Harris. Even if they don't like Trump, mm -hmm. if, they were, if they simply say, I support Donald Trump, uh, a giant percentage of their life uh, is put at risk. And this is in part uh, the particular magic of the Democratic Party is, is that it can make your job, your family life, your marriage, your relationship to your children precarious if you so much as entertain that you might veer to the other party uh, and take a vacation for an election cycle or two. So much has happened this cycle hmm. that you have to keep an open mind that um, we may have some stunning changes, reversals, and I, I will say this, J.D. Vance is a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd vote for J.D. Vance in a heartbeat because the person who's campaigning is J.D. Vance versus the person I know is J.D. Vance uh, are two different things. I don't much care for the campaigner J.D. Vance, but J.D. Vance, the actual human being, uh, is somebody that I know, I trust in many ways, and he really, I promise you this, he really, really cares about the people that progressive Americans used to care about, which is the uh, the out of luck, um, working poor American families. And in particular, the deplorables, the hillbillies, and the people that the Democratic Party um, under the Clintons just shat all over and walked away from. A Trump voter is simply, as I've said before, somebody who believes that the expected value of a Trump presidency uh, minus the expected value of a Kamala presidency is positive. It doesn't tell you whether the person even likes Trump. Right. I can tell you that there are people who absolutely detest Donald Trump, who would, who would walk in front of a bullet to save him because they believe that he is a better choice for the republic. I think that what, what the left has to do is to go far beyond what Nicholas Kristof is saying. Save your pity, uh, Mr. Kristof. The, the, the real issue is that Trump voters are often extremely smart. They're often paying attention. They often dislike Trump intensely. Um, I think that the, the problem is that the American left has created this image of a knuckle-dragging uh, moron in flyover country, as the coasts refer to the heartland of the mm. United States, and they view that person as this benighted, uh, poor soul who's just confused. Mm. And if they don't grow up and get their thumb out of their mouth, uh, and realize that these are their fellow Americans and that many of the Trump voters are smarter than they are, um, we're not going to get anywhere. So I think it's really important to repudiate what, what Christoph is saying. It's repugnant. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you never miss out on our latest content.